I think from the previous lectures, uh, it has become obvious that Zonnestrau has been an example, in a way, uh, in what I call modern conservation, you know, to avoid the notion of the conservation of modern movement buildings. So I call it modern conservation just to be more brief. So I decided to um, subtitle my lecture actually. Um, Zonnestrau means ray of sunlight, so maybe Zonnestrau has been a ray of light in modern conservation for the past 25 years. Um, <clears throat> the conservation of significant modern buildings as works of art represents a demanding economic and physical problem. And not only because of the sheer numbers of modern buildings that deserve our attention. One of the prime challenges we wish to address here is that the innovative technologies that were used were no longer based on long-standing building traditions and craftsmanship. In the course of the Industrial Revolution, industrialization and the consequent process of urbanization triggered the demand for new and particular building types. The functional programs for such buildings became increasingly diverse and specific and, as a result, more short-lived as well. In the 1910s and 20s, architects, at least in the Netherlands, started to acknowledge a direct link between the design of a building, its technical lifespan, and user requirements over time. As the functional lifespan shortened as well, time and transitoriness ultimately became important issues in the architectural discourse. Consequently, this leads either to a transitory architecture or an adaptable one. The consequent translation of these ideas into practice produced the specific, specific architecture of the modern movement, of which Sanatorium Zonnestraal in Hilversum is a stunning example in the Netherlands. Ruled by the principle of utmost functionality, a rigorous distinction was followed out between load-bearing structures and infills to allow for maximum functional flexibility. Light and transparent materials in the facade were to ensure the unhampered access of daylight and fresh air. Related to the idea of varied lifespans was the introduction of prefabrication for building, for building components, allowing the easy replacement of deteriorated parts and future adaptation to respond to functional change. As the architects of the modern movement were faced with the challenge to produce housing, workspaces and facilities for the masses with very limited means, there were many experiments to build with new and low-cost experimental building technologies. Architects tried to take advantage of the specific qualities of materials, which led to the principle of the functionally differentiated outer wall, as was introduced in an inquiry by Siam in 1939, that was unfortunately never followed up due to World War II. At the same time, they tried to construct as light as possible with a minimum of material used. Sonnestraal's architect, Jan Duiker, named this spiritual economy that, as he wrote in 1932, leads to the ultimate construction depending on the applied material and develops towards the immaterial, the spiritual. He introduced this notion of spiritual economy so as to distinguish it from financial economy. In their search for optimal constructions, um, buildings were designed with an extreme sensitiveness concerning building physics, as Kyle already pointed out. It's rather the, the combination of their, uh, their dedication to the experiment with a degree of professional naivety, not to mention the wish for a minimalist aesthetic to be realized by use of young technologies that lies the origin of many of early modern architecture's technical shortcomings. With Zonnestrau, the initially designed between 1926 and 28, Duiker, with his associate Bernard Bijvoet, produced a first and arguably most direct response to a short-lived functional program in his professional life. Duiker advocated an architecture that would be the result of reason rather than style, and he attributed great value to the connection between form, function, material, economy, and time. As a result, he regarded buildings as utilities with a limited lifespan by definition, and occasionally even as throwaways or disposables, like the sanatorium. He promoted the idea that whenever a building's purpose had to change, the form would seize its right to exist and the building must be adapted or demolished altogether. <clears throat> 
Based on a solid belief in science and progress, the sanatorium buildings were established in the conviction that tuberculosis would be exterminated within 30 years. The architect managed managed to subtly balance user requirements and technical lifespan with the limited budget of the client, creating structures of breathtaking beauty and great fragility at the same time. According to Bainer's 1923 definition of functionalism, planning departs from the program and involves the careful design of individual spaces for each particular function with specific dimensions and performance characteristics, organically producing a tailor-made suit. In Zonnestal's main building, each room has particular dimensions, and even the height of the parapet, as you can see here, uh, varies according to the use of the space concerned. It is self-evident that the specificity of this architectural solution went hand in hand with a short functional life expectancy. We are thus faced with a dilemma if we want to preserve these throwaway buildings for posterity. Must we pay heed to the ideas of the original designer and even tear down the structure or allow it to go to ruin and limit ourselves to its comprehensive documentation? As an alternative, do we bypass these idiosyncratic intentions of the original designer by preserving the object in some form or other because of the exceptional quality that we now ascribe to the building? Pursuing this line of reasoning, the function of the structure will in future not only be utilitarian, but primarily cultural, scientific, and emotional. In other words, from now on, the building's chief function is as a monument. The restoration of Zonnestral corroborates our alignment with this latter train of thought. The priority for us, as architects responsible for the restoration, is to ascertain the margins for maneuver within which the essence of the original character remains intact. The sanatorium was part of a larger aftercare colony for tubercular patients founded by the Diamond Workers Union of Amsterdam in 1919. The buildings feature an extremely light reinforced concrete load-bearing frame and are almost like a functional program enclosed by a steel, glass and plaster envelope. An American system for light facades and partitions made of plastered metal mesh published by structural engineer Wiemiga in 1926, was copied for the Zonnestal pavilions. Though aimed at industrial mass production and the dry assemblage of prefabricated building parts, most solutions actually adopted in the main building still involve handmade prototypes with all the related problems and failures. By using cheaper non-galvanized steel windows, he limited the technical lifespan of the buildings, though they would surely last for the expected functional lifespan of 30 years. Moreover, as part of their labor therapy, plan, uh, patients were planned to paint the steelwork regularly, avoiding excess maintenance cost. The main building of 1928 involved a prototypical curtain wall consisting of individual un window units of 25 mm deep steel profiles. These casings were prefabricated and mounted on site against steel posts that ran between the floors. To save material, the second and further window units came with just one jam and were fixed against the previous casing to create a stable unity, actually producing one large window frame over the full 33 meters of the building's length. That's almost 100 feet. The lack of any tolerance in the joint between the casings, of course, gave rise to problems in controlling the measures. Also, the window profiles were so shallow that the 1.5 meter wide top hand casements were too unstable to avoid early glass breakage. When the, pavilion, when the other pavilion was finalized in 1931, these shortcomings were countered by choosing a stronger 32 mm profile series and by introducing side hung casements, as you see here, of a much more limited size. And also by designing independent steel framed window casings that were placed between the steel posts with sufficient tolerance, largely according to contemporary curtain wall systems. So this is a horizontal section. Is that working? Yeah, this is a horizontal section. The curtain wall and the changes in its design within just three years illustrates how the sanatorium complex is a unique witness to the rapid developments in building technology in the second half of the 1920s. As predicted by Duiker and his client in the 1920s, Zonnestraal became obsolete by the mid-1950s. So that's indeed 30 years after it was completed. Eventually, it was the commercial availability of penicillin that put an end to the need for sanatoria. In 
The buildings were transformed into a general hospital in 1957, just before they reached the life expectancy of 30 years. To this end, the buildings were completely refurbished and the slender steel-framed window casings replaced by wide aluminium ones with double glazing in the 1970s to respond to the global energy crisis. You see a few pictures. The 1931 pavilion, however, was largely left as it was. Obsolete since the early 1980s, the windows were soon broken and the concrete frame, now fully exposed to wear and tear, suffered from corroding rebar and partly collapsed in, 19, in 2001. One of the most complex issues to assess is how the architects themselves saw the performance of their buildings in terms of building physics in relation to the system for heating and cooling they devised. Many of the modern movement architects realized that the ideal of lightweight buildings with an open plan would only be feasible in our climate if the climate control systems were part and parcel of the architectural concept as a whole. They therefore developed a wide-ranging interest in climate control systems, and some of them contributed to the swift development of equipment for ventilation, heating and cooling in the years between the wars. Many of these experiments failed and were easily forgotten, which poses a particular problem when we run into them when planning conservation works. There is still plenty of research required to construct a more complete picture of these developments. Despite the failure of some of these technological innovations, we must be aware that these experiments represent a specific historic value of their own, and their proper documentation, and even then conservation, can therefore be well worth the effort. Therefore, at Zonostra, we have tried to restore the most essential elements of the installations, like the tubular heating radiators in the most public areas of the buildings, such as the corridors and the main hall upstairs that you see here. Another challenge has been that these buildings have been designed at a time when the energy performance of buildings was quite differently regarded as we do since the energy crisis of the 1970s. Even Sonostrau had been designed with a user in mind who advocated to keep all windows open at all times, also in winter. So what's the use of thermal insulation? Despite efforts to improve the performance of the buildings in energetic terms, it has been obvious right from the start that present requirements can never be met without totally destroying the essential lightness and fragility of Sonostrau when restoring it. As a result, the comfort levels inside will be hardly fair according to pleasant standards. And rather than trying to change this against all odds, against all odds we propose to look for a new and appropriate use that could comply with these facts. Matching form and function reminds of Duikers' efforts when designing the buildings 80 years ago. But Louis Sullivan's credo, form follows function, now had to be reversed. Function followed form. The healthcare center that Sonostal is today involves a variety of independent polyclinical health services and additional conference facilities in the main building. The works largely involve the reconstruction of the original facades, partitions and finishes, and there has been little conservation or restoration of authentic materials except for the concrete structural frame, a few partitions, and the salvage parts of one facade. As the essential meaning of this building, according to me, lies within the conceptual starting points of the original designers, and the project has been aimed at revitalizing the perception thereof, to my mind, one could successfully argue that it still concerns a true restoration. Yet, in the course of the 20 years of preparatory research and planning, we came to realize that also the material aspect was vital to revitalize Duyker's architectural concept successfully and to make the full cultural context of Sonostral comprehensible to the public at large. Some lost parts have been carefully reconstructed at high cost, such as the steel window casements, the drawn sheet glass, and finishes like the linoleum and the terrazzo floorings in particular areas. Some parts, like window hardware, may have been industrially produced in the 1920s, but have since been taken out of production and had to be handcrafted for the restoration at high expense. In a way, the functionalist principles in which the sanatorium buildings originate have caused, have caused us to attach greater value to the truthfulness of the very materials than has been the case in some other restoration cases of modern buildings, as is demonstrated by the case of the vanilla factories, for instance. Also, it required much more craftsmanship than we anticipated at first. Apart from a section that could be reconstructed from salvage material that you see here, the facades have been built up from new steel-framed window casements. As the shallow 25mm profiles of the original casements could not hold double glazing, 
and the initial stability problems had to be avoided, the new units have been made of slightly heavier 32 mm profiles, similar to the improved version of 30 mm that Duiker himself used in the 1931 pavilion. To respond to guarantee requirements, we decided to redesign the facade into a series of individual casements, fixed against the vertical post with a minimum acceptable tolerance of three millimeters in the joint between them. The filling, by filling the joint with a flexible sealant and pushing it back by a fingernail, the joints slightly show and indicate which sections of the facade are actually new. To the right is the new, to the left is the original. The heavenly blue shade of the casings, with a remarkable touch of violet, makes the steel frames dissolve against the sky. Being nothing more than a concrete frame with a transparent membrane enclosing it, the choice of the glazing was particularly essential. Sonos style predates the invention, the invention of float glass, which became readily available only in the late 1960s. Drawn sheet glass, as used for Sonos style, is slightly warped, producing vertical distortions, which was essential to the vision and reflection qualities of the state-of-the-art curtain wall of 1928. Moreover, the colorless glass of the 1920s, made of low iron sand, that has since been finished in Western Europe, could only be found at reasonable cost in Lithuania. So we imported it. Single glass has been used again in spaces that did not require careful climate control, such as corridors and staircases, as well as the spacious rooms like the main hall upstairs that would allow people to move away from the glazing sufficiently not to be affected by cold drafts. As the cross shape of the hall easily allows to, to look through four layers of glazing, the issue of glass collar has been particularly essential here. I think the illustration speaks for itself. And that our glass is not colorless. You see here, this is a piece taken from a glass oven uh, after it shuts down. And here you can see very easily how really green our glass actually is. We don't even notice it anymore. For the workspaces, single glazing was not, was not acceptable. And a sophisticated solution for double glazing was des designed to meet the, the required conditions. As double and single glazing would be applied ne right next to each other, it was particularly important to reduce any differences in appearance between the single glass and the double glazing. Therefore, we wanted the Lithuanian glass for the outside pane to have the same type of reflection. To avoid any coloring of the double glass unit as compared to the single glass next to it, we had Starfire float glass imported from the USA for the inside pane, which is of even more neutral color. Recent developments in ultraviolet proof adhesive technology allowed, allowed the warped Lithuanian glass to be joined with the float glass pane. Instead of the standard polished metal spacer, we used neutral gray UPVC, making the double glazing even less visible. On close inspection, the expert eye may find the multiple reflection on the double glazing units slightly, slightly diverging from those of the single panes, but casually seen, and surely from a certain distance, the slightly blurred reflections from the sheet glass surface are predominant. The 11 mm thick double glazing units could be accommodated by the new window units. The increased depth of 32 mm of the steel profiles allowed for similar putty, putty framing as found in the original single glazed uh, section of the facade. So both had like 11 mm left for the, for the putty. As the original radiators were fueled by steam and their replicas by hot water, additional floor heating was applied for the single glazed main hall. Together with some reflective curtains, solar gain is largely compensated by switching the floor heating to cold water in the summer. The reconstructed podium doubles as a ventilation duct, allowing cold air to the central part of the hall for additional cooling. In doing so, a climate control system according to present standards could be inserted to ensure a pleasant indoor climate ar around the year without compromising the fragile transparency of the original building. At first, my client didn't want a podium, but he did want a climate control system. So I told him, if we put the climate control system against the ceiling, it will ruin the architecture completely. So the only way we can deal with it is put it on the floor. And then we have to cover it, and then we have a podium. <laughs> so. Form follows function, function follows form, it's up to you. And I'm going to show a few pictures uh, of the result, and proudly referring also to the 2001 Knoll World Monument Fund Modernism Prize that we won with this project. You see the back of the building in the original condition and how we inserted an elevator over here, also in 
completely colorless glass. You can tell, you know, the white of the concrete, the paint on the concrete, actually is not affected by the glazing at all. The original, 1928. This is 2003. Even the design of the boiler house was carefully laid out, if you compare it with the previous one, to mimic more or less the original. Some of the interiors, I'm not going into the detail about the linoleums and all the finishes that we redid. A doctor's room. This is the 1931 pavilion already shown by Kyle after the restoration. It still stands without a use, so the inside is not restored. We only restored the outside so far. Which means that after uh, 25 years, we're about uh, halfway done with this project. We have the main building restored outside and inside, and we have the outside of one of the two pavilions restored, not the inside. And the third building, which is the second pavilion, is not restored at all. So sometimes it takes a while. So I think this quotation says it all. That was Duiker's idea of architecture and nature and the way they interacted. I think it's a beautiful saying. Well, in contrast to Zonnestrau, the factories for the Vanella company seem to evoke a striking demonstration of Bayern's definition of rationalism, providing large quantities of generic space to accommodate functions that would greatly vary over time. The A-specificness of the factory hall suggested a long functional lifespan as well as a long technical life expectancy. Modeled after the American Daylight Factory, the shallowness of the structure was essential and explains the linear layout of the floor scheme. In contrast to the artisan approach for Zonnestrau, the rationalist approach of the Vanellic architects allowed for a restoration that has been of a more conceptual nature, aimed at the manageability of change rather than the material aspects of the artifact. And today it is a business center for the creative industry. In order to create appropriate workspaces, the principle of a double facade has been proposed, introducing secondary glazing on the inside, leaving the original facade intact. Here you see, the as we say, the shadow side, so it's where the morning sun comes in. We um, choose to have a very wide cavity and call it a corridor. So actually, you, you use the cavity of the outer construction, the outer wall, as a corridor. And on the other side, it's like a climate wall where, um, where all the acoustic and thermal problems are uh, resolved um, in an easy way. But what, what is striking to me as well is, here you see the climate control system. I'm not going to, into detail about all that. It's well published and, and, and lectured on. So you see the original floors and how it's used today. This is a colleague architect making use of the building. Electric light was very instrumental, and we paid a lot of attention to the light color, uh, similar to what we did with the sanatorium project. The coffee toasting department, which is used as our lunch restaurant and coffee outlet, meeting point, and so on, and maybe at night as a catwalk for a show. And the ground floor, which we use for events, it's rented out. So it's amazing, to my mind, how the creative businesses and designers that rent spaces here today actually still identify with the iconic image of the vanilla factories of 80 years ago. And I, to my mind, that's an example of uh, the sustainability of timeless design. Well, to draw some conclusions, if I may, um, when speaking about an architecture that pursued industrial building methods and the assembly of machine-produced components, one would argue that the very materials are indeed not essential. I think the windows of Sonnestrau prove that point. In view of the underlying philosophy, many building materials applied in such structures may be short-lived. And as, as the authenticity of materials is therefore often difficult to maintain, a convenient argument to ignore the material aspects of these modern prototypes seems therefore at hand. But the restoration of Sonnestrau also taught us that such an alibi can easily be false. Precisely in the case of Duiker's works, it made us understand that the exposed constructions themselves are vital to the original concept. And even if some of this, uh, uh, these technological interventions or innovations, sorry, even if they failed, we must be aware that these experiments of modern engineers and architects represent a historic significance of their own. That material truthfulness of the restored building 
helps us to understand what may appear to us as the anachronisms of the era. Absor observing the obvious differences between both projects, we realized how the contrasting visions in the 1920s of how to respond short-lived functional programs, as suggested by Bainer's definitions, have produced buildings that show great differences regarding their suitability for adaptive reuse. A tailor-made functionalist building like Zonestral proved not to be easily adaptable to functional change and is likely to have a short functional life expectancy, as opposed to such striking examples of rationalism as the vanilla factories, where the ge generic space could be relatively easy, easily adapted to a new use as a center for design studios. So even within the modern movement, various architectural concepts led to principally different um, differences between modern buildings that must again lead to different approaches when planning their restoration. So I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the original design philosophy, to my mind, is still guiding in the restoration work and I do think that's a different difference with traditional conservation indeed. This underlines the necessity to study comprehensively the conceptual background of a building next to the material aspects before making decisions as part of the redesign uh, the redesigning or restoration project process. So what is needed in the field today, I think, is further research and doc documentation of seminal building technologies of the modern movement. We've done quite a bit on that. We've done books. Books need to be redone after 20 years. I think there's a, there's a field of interest for, um, for us. The second is that the, the, uh, the development of climate control systems so far is very poorly researched and poorly documented, and that's a great lack in our work today. We simply often don't know what type of systems were used and what we find in these buildings. We simply often don't know what it is. And what I think, uh, that's, that's not only heating and cooling, it's also ventilation, it's all, also daylight control is very important nowadays uh, in terms of uh, to avoid uh, glare in computer screens, for instance, daylighting is very essential. And finally, I think um, is a, a big um, uh, lack in, in, the, in the work today is that we don't have a proper evaluation system of, sustain of sustainability. Because present evaluation system, present evaluation system uh, deals. <coughs> sorry, it's my throat. <coughs> so the, my last remark: um, the lack of um, proper sustainability, sustainability evaluation is because these systems today, like Bream, they're all um, uh, geared towards new, newly constructed buildings and they're not suitable for adaptive reuse. And that means that um, the adaptive reuse projects that we are, are engaged in, they don't qualify to be sustainable, which means that it is sometimes very hard to find funding and, and uh, investors willing to spend money on these buildings because we can't rate the result. We can't say this is a class A building because the system simply is lacking. So that is one, uh, that, those three points I would like to add to the debate for tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you.